see. Um, we have up next is Mia Lepe, who is going to be talking about her research with Reagan Herrera, Hank van der Plug, and uh, Jim Hood. And Mia, I'm sending the controls over to you right now. Thank you. Okay, that looks great. Okay, amazing. Oh, let me turn off this. Um, so hi everybody, I am Amelia and my mentors this summer were Reagan, Hank, and Jim. Uh, the official title is Project 2, Pigment Specific Identification in Western Lake Erie. Uh, but today we're gonna be talking about comparison of phytoplankton identification methods in Western Lake Erie. So harmful algal blooms. Uh, as you can see on the right side of the screen, we have this wonderful picture from Modus imagery of the Western Basin of Lake Erie. And you can see this great green color that is there in, in the basin. And that is a result from a harmful algal bloom. And if you're unfamiliar, we can break it down. So a harmful algal bloom is made up of phytoplankton. And phytoplankton have three big factors that can control the magnitude at which they show up. And that is light, nutrients, and temperature. Any rapid increase of these factors can lead to a bloom. You get harmful algal blooms when the bloom community has an overabundance of cyanobacteria, typically. And these cyanobacteria can produce toxins and can be detrimental to the ecosystem and drinking water resources. So it's important to establish monitoring programs. And there are some great monitoring programs out in the, in the western basin of Lake Erie. And you can see we have sampling sites overlaid on top of the MODIS imagery about approximate locations of these sampling sites that are visited uh, pretty regularly throughout the, the summer, which is bloom season. And these monitoring programs use a collective of different techniques to get a robust idea of what is happening within the water. And that is remote sensing, an example, one, the image. Um, also genetic techniques using uh, genomics and, and um, genetics in the water buoys and chlorophyll measuring instruments, which is a fun way of saying things that can go in the water to see what is happening. And that is what we'll be talking about today. So our chlorophyll measuring instrument, uh, one of them is the fluoroprobe. And there's a couple different models uh, of these out there, but we are using the BBE model. And fluoroprobes are great for chlorophyll analysis. They are able to identify five different classes within the algae blooms. Uh, broken down into green algae, blue-green algae, or cyanobacteria, diatoms, or sometimes referred to as brown algae, and cryptophyta and yellow substances, which is a proxy for color-dissolved organic matter. And I want to make a note of this because CDOM, or color-dissolved organic matter, can confuse the sensor sometimes and trick it into seeing things that aren't there or mistaking who is there. Um, and these seem great. They, they seem as if they're plug and play and you can drop it in and have a great understanding of what's going on in the water. But our question here is how reliable is it? And we need some method to compare it to. And the traditional methods to compare it to are the photopigment analysis or using a fluorometer, which is um, on the right side of the screen. And that is a fluorometer. I think it's the same one, <laughs> the same model that they have in the lab. And this traditional method is time consuming. You spend a lot of time in a dark room, messing with chemicals, liquefying the algae to get its contents and then looking at it. But it is very reliable and there's a reason why it's the traditional method. So that brings us to our main question. How do these two compare? Are, these, are the fluoroprobe and the photopigment analysis methods, the fluorometer, comparable? And if they are, are we able to use the fluoroprobe measurements to estimate cyanobacteria concentrations? Because that's going to give us an a idea to the impact that these harmful algal blooms will have in the ecosystem. So an overview of the data. We have the two data types, fluoroprobe, which I mentioned identifies the five phytoplankton classes, and the environmental extracted data. Um, this data is from the National Centers of Environmental Information and it has a lot of other variables in it. But the two that we are most focused on are the two pigment datas, which is chlorophyll A and phycocyanin. And both these methods have some overlapping periods. There is more environmentally extracted data 
than there is fluorocope data. So when you match, date match, we have about a date range from 2015 to 2019. So uh, the big methods that we used are looking at these pigments, like I mentioned before. Chlorophyll A, which is a proxy for total biomass and getting a good head count on who is there in the water and the magnitude at which they are there. Uh, the other pigment, the accessory pigment, is phycocyanin, and that is going to be a proxy for our cyanobacteria and the amount of toxins in the water. And we're able to use these, access these accessory pigments because of the, the spectra that they, they are picked up on. And you can see to the right that there is a certain ratio when the sensor looks at it that we can pull from and say, you are exhibiting a certain ratio. We know you are a diatom or we know you are a cyanobacteria. Um, so that is the main reason why are, we are able to make these comparisons of the quote unquote who is in the water. All statistical, um, the statistical software I used to make these comparisons was our studio and we will be looking at a bunch of linear models. So right off the bat, the fluoroprobe versus the fluorometer. Uh, on the y-axis, you have the fluoroprobe, and on the x-axis, you have the fluorometer. The one-to-one -one line is that black line, and ideally, if they were totally equal, which is what we want, the blue line and the black line would be laid right on top of each other. As you can see, that is not the case. The blue line is a little bit lower, which means that the fluoroprobe tends to underestimate the amount of total chlorophyll that is presented within the samples. And we have an R-squared value for the blue line of 0.75, which is relatively low. Um, if you look in the bottom right corner of the graph, you can see there's almost this little blob. And upon further investigation, we found that that is from uh, the year 2019, where two different floral probe measurements were taken with diff or excuse me, all the floral probe measurements were taken with two separate instruments. And because we, there is no documentation right now of which fluoroprobe was used for which samples, we cannot use that and include that in our data because we won't be able to correct for it later. So let's remove the year 2019. And we see that actually helps increase our relationship of, of the models a little bit better, about 76. But it's still not on the one-to-one -one line and it's a little bit underestimated. But relatively, this is a this is good indication that we can use the fluoroprobe um, reliably and, and have it in the same ballpark as the fluorometer, fluorometer or the traditional methods. So then we can move on to our next question. And how well does that, oops, sorry, I got ahead of myself. <laughs> so total chlorophyll, backtrack. Um, once, <laughs> excuse me. Total chlorophyll. These are broken down throughout the years. Again, removal of the year 2019. So we have 2015 through 2018. And you can see for most of the years, three of them, three out of the four, it is still underrepresented. But the year 2018 is almost right on the money, which is extremely exciting because that means we can use that year 2018 to serve as a basis for the corrections that we will do later on to, to try and uh, bring the blue line up to the one the one line, which means the methods would be more compare more comparable. Now to the part that I wanted to talk about, about phycocyanin. Um, again, this is a proxy for cyanobacteria and toxins in the water. As you can see, that blue line is almost horizontal. There's not really a good indication of a relationship between these two methods. And it's not a very good R square either. Uh, this this model does not fit um, the, the traditional, the, the fluoroprobe does not compare to the traditional methods. And that's okay because it, it means that we have work to do later. <laughs> um, but so for right now, we cannot do that. But you might be saying, wait, the, the fluoroprobe, I know the way that, that it works. You take it out in the sample, you grab the samples, the samples get transported all the way back to the lab, and then you run the lab, you run it there in the fluoroprobe benchtop version. 
and that there's this big time difference between when the sample is taken and when the measurement is actually done. And that could lead to some artifacts in the data that aren't actually there from the in situ monitoring. And so I actually was able to do a comparison from the same samples at the same time in the lab. Um, and these were on familiar cultures, cultures that they have at the lab. So these are well-known cultures. We know a lot about them, the, the, the space in which they grow and how they grow. So the results from this will help with those corrections that I mentioned beforehand. Um, again, this is both methods that I used. So we use the fluoro probe and it's the bench top version, which you can see in the top right corner uh, photo. And then we use the ferrometer, which is that green picture. And you can actually see the instrument there has little, little boxing gloves. Um, <laughs> and so when we compared these methods for nine samples, we found not the best relationship but it is still wonderful information because like I said, these cultures are very familiar. We know exactly what is in them. We know which ones have toxins and which ones don't. So further down the line, we will be able to use this information for correction methods. But it, despite the model not accurately representing the one-to-one -one line, we still see that it's underrepresenting, the floral probe is still underrepresenting which is consistent with our other findings. So what about these corrections that I've been kind of mentioning? Um, using the year 2018, we did a correction uh, to bring the blue line closer to the one-to-one -one line um, and hopefully have more accurate floral probe measurements. And I'm not going to force you to remember what the other one looked like. I will show you the two compared. <laughs> um, so the corrected data is the red line and the original model is the blue. And as you can see, it may be slight, but it was closer to the one to one line, which means we can correct for at least total chlorophyll or the fluoroprobe and have it calibrated for other missions. So fluoroprobe readings consistently underestimate total chlorophyll concentrations when compared to photopigment analysis or the fluorometer, which is okay, but that's good because that means we are able to correct for it. And yes, we can use the fluoroprobe confidently in future sampling missions. But are we able to use the fluoroprobe to estimate cyanobacteria concentrations? And the answer is not yet. There seems to be some other factors with, with environmental happenings that affect the sensor of the fluoroprobe, giving us less accuracy, not giving us accuracy with um, cyanobacteria estimations. So why does the fluoroprobe underestimate uh, total chlorophyll concentrations? Uh, a big part of this is the stru structural differences of the algae. The fluoroprobe is manufactured somewhere in Europe and calibrated at factory settings to the European algae, which is single cell. Here, we do not have single-celled algae. We have colonial strains of microcystin. Um, and, as, and you can see in the, in the bottom right corner that this shows up very different. So it's no wonder why the sensor is being overwhelmed. There is also variation in the three-dimensional structures of microcystis, depending on what is in the water. If there is more nu certain nutrients or, or differences in temperature, you can have uh, structures that are more vertically aligned, or they'll have pockets and be separated that way. Or sometimes you'll just get a nice even dispersal. That's usually not the case. We would hope that would be the case. Um, and so these introduce optical limitations and the density, bloom density can inhibit transmission to the fluoroprobe, giving these inaccurate readings and causing underestimation of total chlorophyll concentrations. So the next step uh, to understand, one, what is happening in the HABs, and two, how to address that with the fluoroprobe, is the identification of specific phytoplankton dynamic drivers and using generalized additive models to figure out what these drivers are. And by that, I mean, Throughout the summer, we found, and we, we've known, but we've also found in the data, that 
the magnitude of the blooms are not dependent on on just time it's not like climate change it is dependent on year uh, so variation between years and variation between stations and again that's the light nutrients and temperature coming back into play um, so using more models to figure out what those specific are and then the big next step which will make this a lot easier to, cal to calibrate the floral probe is using chemtax data which is accessory pigments for what is in the bloom um, and and creating a pigment library to easily calibrate, or I won't say it's easily, but more easily calibrate the floral probe. And these two next steps would get us to answer the question of who is where, when are they there, and why are they there? And by they, we mean the phytoplankton or the cyanobacteria. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Amelia. Um, let's see. So I'm Got some questions here for you. Um, and hold on a second. I'm having like user error with my um, question box. Let's see. I apologize. I'm, I'm thought it would help if I changed uh, monitors and uh, it only made it worse. Okay. So, <laughs> question from Lindsay Collis. Um, Lindsay asks, from my understanding, you examined the total flora pulp floral probe value versus phycocyanin. Were you able to look at the relationship between the blue-green floral probe, probe group only versus phycocyanin? Mm. Let me know if you need to repeat that. No, I think I understand the question. Um, you can see my screen, correct? Yeah. Okay, let's go back. To the phycocyanin slides. Sorry if this makes you dizzy. Um, so we compared the floral probes output, which is blue greens, to the extracted, the fluorometer is actually the incorrect instrument to say here, that's, so that is my bad, um, to the environment, environmentally extracted data of, of phycocyanin concentrations. Um, so I think that answers your question on using the proxy of phycocyanin to cyanobacteria to the floral probe, which groups that into the, this category of blue-green that they call it. Does that clarify? Yes, thanks, Amelia. And Lindsay, Lindsay uh, confirmed that that did answer her question. So thank you very much for that. Okay, we've got um, a couple of more minutes for questions if anyone has them. Um, uh, Greg Dick asks, he says, great talk, Amelia. Is there any evidence that year-to-year -year variation in the fit between results of floral probe and extractions is due to differences in CDOM. Mm -hmm. um, I'll bring up the slide since we're talking about it with years. Yes, there's a lot of evidence for literature um, that CDOM is probably the one that is that is causing the underestimation. But the, sorry, I'm trying to remember the question at the same time I'm speaking, which isn't the best idea. Um, yes, there is evidence in, in literature that it is CDOM. I wasn't able to look at that. I almost went down a rabbit hole with that, which Reagan might agree with, of looking at CDOM and its cor correlation. But um, that happens to be here, and that is some, some future fellows next step to look at how CDOM affects the, the floral probes reading. Great. Thank you so much, Amelia. Um, and uh, thanks for the questions from the audience. We really appreciate that as well.